presented, which I think is a glorious, meaningful, important thing. And we borrowed it from this book from Parker Palmer called Grace, Gravity, and Growing Old. I think that explains it all, doesn't it? It says, it says so much. And so this is going to be a year-long series on aging. Um, what does it mean to age um, physically and mentally, emotionally? Uh, we will look at particular issues such as what to do with all that stuff. Any of us that are up there, we all have that. I see a few heads shaking. Yes, what am I going to do with all that stuff? Um, what are your health care desires? How do you want to be treated if you are hospitalized or something happens to you? Where do you perhaps draw the line in terms of being kept alive and so forth? We will look at issues around depression. One of the things that happens so often in the aging process is depression and folks dealing with feelings that they have never really experienced before. And how to plan for your future and for your family's future without you. So we have a lot more professional types than me coming to talk to you about the aging process and very specific parts and pieces of, of what that means. But I think this will be a very popular series because truly, as I said earlier, it is one of the few things that we all have in common. We all are aging. It just is. You know, I'm often, are there any millennials here? There's not. Oh, good. I thought that. Close your ears a little for a second. But sometimes, I know, and I, I have a millennial, you know, I have a, a daughter who is in that, or she, she may be younger than a, a millennial. And they all talk about how young, and, and we, we put a lot of emphasis on youth. I know the church does. We love to see young people, and we really try to nurture that and you know, get young people in. We always talk about the value of the church has to do with its young people and, and so forth. But I always think, give them a few more years, and they're not going to be young. So we all are in the process of aging each and every single day. And sometimes, suddenly, out of nowhere, we go, oh my gosh, and we find ourselves in a place that, frankly, we never thought we would be. Um, I remember years ago, I was in seminary, so I was about 22 or 23. My parents had some very dear friends in the city where I was attending seminary. So my first couple of weekends there, before I knew people and met other people, and, Dates. Um, I, <laughs> I would go to these families and and they would all get together for dinner and so forth. I can remember this so clearly. They would all talk about what they couldn't eat anymore and what hurt and where the, where the pain was. And I consciously said to myself, I will yeah, never yeah. ever be like that. Now my friends and I get together, we go, I, I can't touch onions anymore. Or, you know, this thing is growing here. What do you think this is? And, you know, it is really everything that I swore I would never do or be like. So I am. So again, it is the process of aging. And I have, frankly, been thinking a lot about aging lately and what that means. I'm in what is called, some of you are as well, that sandwich generation where um, I, I am a little bit old for it, but I have a 90-year-old mother and an 89-year-old mother-in-law on this hand and a 22-year-old daughter on the other hand. And so I'm trying to tend to, to all of their growth and changes and what's happening with them. And, and in the midst of that, I realized that while my daughter is growing up and older, so is my mother, which means I must be too. And I, I do see it in myself. And actually, I, I realize that others see it in me also. Um, I was just 
someplace a couple of weeks ago and someone asked me if I had any grandchildren and I was like so indignant like <laughs> <laughs> and I realized <laughs> I could easily have grandchildren yes and, and so forth but I was like how do they know I'm that old that's always my question how do they recognize in me that I am the age that could have a grandchild it just takes me back um, but at 65, it certainly could be, and I hear a lot more about um, these things today, and I hear a lot more ma'ams. Yes, ma'am. Yes, how are you, ma'am? Ma'am, would you like the senior discount? Ma'am. <laughs> and I don't know about you, but I can still remember when I got the first thing from the um, art. I went into hibernation for a couple of days. It was like, first I thought they had the wrong address, the wrong name. There was another Lorinda after the, the, the 30 tip, so no. But indeed, you know, there, there are these marks along the way that remind us that we are aging. On the other hand, I'm kind of enjoying the discounts. Do you know those oh. discounts? I'm sorry I don't live in Ohio in some ways anymore because they have this golden buckeye card. You could go into any restaurant, movie, any place, and you would get this discount. And I thought it was the greatest thing because I didn't think I'd never get there, you know, so for other people. But I do kind of appreciate those, those discounts. I tell you one other story about my mother, which also kind of hits where I am as well. I remember years ago, she and I were hiking, and I was trying to put the timing on this. How old would she have been? And close as I can figure, she was probably about 55. So she's t she was 10 years younger than I am now. And as we were hiking together, she said to me, I know what age I am, but I don't feel this age. And I don't know what to do about that. Well, in my mind, I thought she looked that age. I thought she had her because I was so much younger. Now I get exactly what she was saying. That I suspect if I were to go around and ask you, Connie, what age do you feel like? 16. 16. Oh, no. Forrest, what age do you feel like on a good day? 75. Then there are those who feel their age, exactly. But I think for many of us, there is that chronological age, that age that is on our birth certificate and on our driver's license and on all of our legal kinds of documents. But then there's that age that we feel. And most of the time, it doesn't quite match up that I suspect we all feel a lot younger. Years ago, maybe about 15 years ago or so forth, I went back to my college where I had graduated, and as I was walking along, I remember thinking, they must think I'm a college student here. And I <laughs> sat this to my friend, and she said, no, they think you're a mother here, you know, because <laughs> being their child. So I think sometimes we have this perception of ourselves or this image of ourselves. And then suddenly when you do hear the yes ma'ams or would you like that senior discount or people ask you a question that puts you in another age bracket, you go, oh yeah. But I'm not sure that we ever necessarily feel that way. The other memory I have in talking about aging also comes from my father, um, as he, in the last three months of his life, and he was incredibly active. He was a, a runner, he just was, had vitality and spirit and so forth. But the last couple of months, he really slowed down as he was dealing with this, this blood infection and condition. And I remember him saying to me, and he, he wouldn't necessarily always talk about himself. The men of that generation didn't often share things and so forth. But what he said was, I used to wonder how I was going to die. And as a runner, he would do that. He would go out and he would run. And you know, you have a lot of time to think when you're running five, six miles. He, he was a long distance runner. 
And he said he would so often think, I wonder how I'm going to die. And he had this aha uh -huh, of this, this is it. And so when we talk about aging, if we're going to be really honest with ourselves, we do have to kind of face not only our age, our chronological age, who we are, but we have to think about sometimes the unthinkable, our passing or our death, because it is a natural <coughs> part of where we are going. So I don't think we can come out of this conversation about aging without reflecting as well on our own death and what the end of life might mean for us. But I want to begin with a quote from all people, Yoko Ono. Yoko Ono, remember, she was part of that generation that said we can't trust anyone over 30. Well, she now is beyond 30 and has, but she's, she once said this, Spring passes, and one remembers one's innocence. Summer passes, and one remembers one's exuberance. Autumn passes, and one remembers one's reverence. Winter passes, and one remembers one's perseverance. I like that about the stages of life. That in our, our early days, we, we remember our innocence in the springtime of our life. We were naive. We were innocent. If only we had known then, maybe not. You know, I sometimes look at little, like, I had a little visit, maybe you saw Lori Smiley from this baby who's a month and a half old, and her dear dad was taking care of her and swaddling her and holding her and feeding her and making sure she was okay. And I thought, Oh, I would love to have that happen to me. If only I knew then I had the consciousness to say, this is great. <laughs> but it's, but we, we don't. But there is an innocence and naivety to those early spring years. And then summer passes, and we remember our exuberance. Remember how much energy we once had, or vitality, or how things didn't hurt so much when you stood up, or you weren't so afraid of going ice skating, you know, like you might fall and break a hip now, and, and so forth, or, or changing things. So there was a lot more, I think, exuberance in our summer. All the passes, and we remember our reverence. That might be where a lot of you are. Have a reverence for life, an appreciation for all that is and could be and all the possibilities of, of it all. And then winter passes, our senior, senior days, and we remember our perseverance. How are we going to persevere through all of the changes, the attitudes, and so forth? So we come to Parker Palmer's book, On the Brink of Everything, Grace, Gravity, and Getting Old. I have to tell you, I like the title a lot more than I like the book. <laughs> Parker, Parker Palmer is an incredible <coughs> writer. He has written some amazing things, and I encourage you, if you did not love this book, to read some other things by him, because he is insightful, he is thoughtful, he, he's an incredible writer. But this book for me wasn't Halfway through. Halfway through. Yeah. It's itself over and over. Yeah. And, and I kind of said to, you know, Lisa, when we were proposes, I said, you know, part of the Palmer has this great book. And I do think the title is fabulous. I just think it's, it's really good. On the brink of everything. I, you know, I think that is such a, a great way of looking at growing old and standing on the cusp of, of life as it unfolds. But I have to say, I do think there are some really good things in it. Why is it a your book? Uh, did, did you say, how did you bring your book? Yeah. Yeah. Thomas Merton. Thomas Merton. We talked about a lot. Yeah. yeah. On page four, for those of you who have the book, and, and I do want to encourage you to maybe still get the book and read it. it Everyone comes to books in different ways, don't they? So you may you may like it. But on page four, he writes this. 
I don't want to fight the gravity of aging. It's nature's way. I want to collaborate with it as best I can in hopes of going down with something like the grace of that setting sun. For all the wrinkles and worry lines, it's a lovely thing simply to be one of those who live long enough to say, I'm getting old. Today I smile at the notion of collaborating with aging. It reminds me of the exchange between the 19th century transcendentalist Margaret Fuller and the writer Thomas Carlyle. I accept the universe, proclaimed Fuller. Gad, she better, replied Carlyle. I'm with her in this little spat, though I do admire his wit. We have no choice about death. But we do have choices to make about how we hold the inevitable. Choices made difficult by a culture that celebrates youth, disparages old age, and discourages us from facing into our mortality. The laws of nature that dictate the sunset dictate our demise. But how we travel the arc between our own sunrise and sundown is ours to choose. Will it be denial, defiance, or collaboration? That's the question that I really appreciate that he poses in the beginning of this book. <coughs> How will we travel that arc between our sunrise and our sundown? Will it be denial? Will it be defiance? Or will it be collaboration? And I really like that concept of collaboration with aging. I love the idea of collaborating with the community about aging. Um, it's not necessarily something that we talk about honestly and forthrightly with everyone. Maybe occasionally a, a best friend or a girlfriend who feels the same aches or pains or a spouse or a partner and, and so forth. But, <coughs> I do believe that being part of a wise congregation is recognizing our shared experiences and challenges, our hopes and joys within a framework of strong mental health. So today is about collaborating and hearing from some of you about the experience of aging. Because I do think we can learn from one another. Sometimes it gives us a little peace of mind to know that others are having the same experiences that we are. And there are some people who can give us insight into what might be yet ahead or what to look for, what to anticipate and to expect. But I so believe that the idea of collaborating with the community is so important. So I just, I want to keep it short and sweet here and not, because we don't have a lot of time, and go into long thoughts and reflections, because we'll have plenty of time to do this. We're going to face this this entire year. But briefly, any of you who wish, I'd love to hear from you. What was the first sign for you that you were aging? Do you remember something? Well, my mother and I have the same exact name, Margaret Brett. And for years I had to keep her accounts different in bank, different banks, different pharmacies, etc. And by the time I was getting older, she was living with them. And one day I checked in the mail and I see something from AARP and I hand it to my mother and she opens it up and she starts laughing. <laughs> and I said, what is it? She goes, oh, it's not for me, it's for you. <laughs> That's when I was here. Always stuck with you. That was your side. Yep. Others. Yes. Well, I remember hiking like yourself. I was with my son. And also, there was, I was like in my 50s, I think. And I was huffing and puffing because we had been hiking all day, coming all the way up and all the way back. And he was alarmed. He ran ahead and got a tractor. That was in the field. My mom needs a little. So I called my mom, I'm like, I'll make it, David, I can do that. But that was awareness that I couldn't keep up with him anymore, and that, yes, I did get a tractor, but he was so concerned, I did get on one, just to keep him happy, but that was an awareness. It's when I others see, see that in you, yes. and then you recognize yes. that maybe they're onto something. 
Yes, others. Nancy. Mine was my <coughs> first trip and fall on my knees. Mm -hmm. And the fear. And my knees. You've got to walk with me again. That was a real problem. And it's only been next 10 years. Joy, I hear that. It was when she and had her first. I'm only 78, so. It was when she was had her first yeah. fall, that big fall on her knees. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Everyone else was hiking around with their kids and my niece, my sister, everything. And I had a walking shoe. Yeah. Yeah. And it's never been the same thing. Yeah. <coughs> it is when you walk differently. Some of you walk differently today than you used to. Where are your eyes when you walk? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. In my case, I do notice changes, but they, in my mind, would just still equate with my age. Somehow I uh, mentally haven't overcome 30, even though my physical body, mm -hmm. of course, you know, takes the speeding and so forth, but I just don't want to miss the opportunity to just live that stage and just, uh, then just disappear from this world without having plan to live this age as maybe I should have perhaps uh, not only the, the negative or the uh, uh, tear down physical and otherwise but uh, just to have some good feelings about this age and just to leave this world having experience in that age. And what Paul would say is that that's the collaboration with age and you come to the agreement with aging, that I'm going to age, but I'm not going to do it lightly or without fighting it or resisting it along the ways. At 78, I found the secret. I'm going to hold it 55. There you go. <laughs> but my friend said I'll lose my senior discount. I know, see? <laughs> that is the tension, isn't it? <laughs> it is. Yes. I find that, um, that the wisdom. That's what I'm really like enjoying. <coughs> the wisdom of of how you handle things and how it's like you've been through life, you have so many experiences and you know that things come and things go, you know, things come and they go. And you're not so because when you're young you're like, you gotta have it right now, you wanna change right now, you have a problem, it's like it's gotta be fixed. But when you get older you, you go home, you you ponder, you think about the solutions, and you don't get so hooked up in that problem. You know, you, and I find that the beauty of aging is that being able to just um, solve, solve issues in time. It's not going to be immediate sometimes, sometimes it's a week, sometimes it's a month, sometimes it's a year. And how are you not hooked up on that instantaneous, let's solve this right now? Well, our instincts are home better. Our gut is better. Um, I think we're more improved with how we perceive things and if we can use that, that wisdom. I have a, a dear friend who's a physician, and he said that back after he came out of medical school, when someone would come in with an ailment, he'd go through this whole process of everything, you know, like checking the heart and pulse and I mean, everything. Now they walk in, he can immediately say, I think this is your situation because he's grown into that. And I think that's some of the wisdom of our own growing older, too, that we, we've been through enough that we see things and can, can do that. My father, as you know, was a pastor. And when I first started out, it, you know, 40 years ago, being a woman in ministry was a little tough. There weren't a lot of us back back then. And he said to me, mark my word, it won't be the seniors that are going to have problems with you. It's going to be the younger folks, like middle age and so forth. Because the seniors have seen enough changes in their lives. They've gone through enough things to know that nothing remains the same, that things are constantly changing. They're going to be okay. It's going to be those younger people who are like, I want it like it used to be, and I want that male voice in the pulpit, and I want Dr. Smith, who was my favorite pastor, and you know, that kind of thing. And he was right. But I do think there is a place where we cross over and 
we kind of say life throws us up lots of stuff. So we're just going to kind of roll with the changes. And that's gift of grace. That is really good. Come on, there's Mary. Um, I was for myself. My first really thing was the death of my husband. When mm -hmm. losing your spouse, the impossible happens. So your own mortality is, is also a lot. You know, in front of you as well. So that's, you know, how that's much it, it changes the way. the way you look at things. Absolutely. You know, what, at times when we lose maybe a parent, as, as hard and painful as that is, in some ways that seems like the natural step. That's how it should be. But when you lose a peer, when you maybe lose a spouse, or how many of you have lost a sibling? I've not had to gratefully go through that yet, but it's got to be tough. Someone that you grew up with that had shared experiences is probably right around your age group that that loss has got to be really deep and you begin to question things or you start to lose your peers. People you went, we have a guy from our high school. I, I sometimes think he's got to find another wife, but that's my, because he, he reads the obituaries every single day. And if anyone from our class passed away, he, he sends it out to all of us. But that list is getting longer and longer and longer. And you think, wow, wow. <coughs> couple more, couple more signs, yes. I think just looking in the mirror and seeing someone who doesn't look like I'm <laughs>
was, she feels the aging when her kids say, next summer, let's go to the mountains. She goes, sure, goes, I wonder if I'll be here. Um, good question. Thank you for sharing that. It was very meaningful. Yes. I, I want to share another side. I think I may not relate to everything and what Carol said. <laughs> my internet goes out. I have to kneel down or go under my desk and do this thing. Nancy, uh, I, can you speak I chat right? with my knees before I get the phone. You know, Nancy, you want to stand up. You mind just oh, no. because, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, I need you to have you all do that. Thank, Thank you. you. You can't imagine when you aren't there not being able to kneel down on your knees on the floor and get something. Or get into a bathtub, not the hard part. Lowering yourself in the bathtub, hard part number one. Getting out, I wouldn't even attempt it anymore because it's not safe. But what I do want to say is I'm at the stage of almost 78 of seeing the good side of aging and wisdom that it, you said. It, it is a beautiful thing that I never had early enough. Um, I appreciate all, so many things. And I, I am so much more spiritual than I was when I was just, you know, all I thought of was the next new pair of shoes I could buy or whatever looked good on this or that. And now it's not that way. And I wake up, and I hope some of you do, saying this day is beautiful, even if it's raining, even if it's thundering or whatever. It's a new day. It's just a new day. And um, that's the way I want to keep on thinking. And I recognize my own wisdom, and I say or do something that's wise, which I haven't done all my life. I just want to show another side, and it's the one I'm choosing, even as I'm lightening my load and not being able to get down the floor or whatever. It I'm, is I'm about intentionality, and, and I do have to say that Palmer really does talk about the intentionality of how we age. And again, that term that I so like to use is collaborating with aging. Yeah. that we collaborate with it. We make a deal yeah. with ourselves, with our soul, with our mind, with our bodies. Okay, I'll tell you what. If you do this, I'll do that. But we're going to try to keep going. We're going to kind of move together. We're going to collaborate as the time goes on. My example of that is simply, I, my daughter loves ice skating. And about a year ago, I thought, I'm not sure I can ice skate anymore because I might fall, as we all know I'm a faller anyway, but then I might this time break my hip. And I thought, wow, where did that come from? But you, you start to season those things, and then I'm torn between thinking, I love ice skating, and it's fun, and it's healthy, but now you're going to be in traction for six months. So, you know, it's, it's all of that. Let me say, bring to you what Parker also says, and I love this, this is in the book. Most older folks I know fret about unloading material goods they collected over the years. I think, yes, okay. The stuff that was once useful to them, or not, but now prevents them from moving freely around their homes. But the junk I really need to jettison in my old age is psychological junk such as long-time convictions about what gives my life meaning that no longer serve me well. For example, who will I be when I can no longer do the work that has been a primary source of identity for me? And I'm surprised that some of you did not mention that. It's sometimes upon retirement or change of jobs, suddenly that's a real sign of aging because we're so identified often by the work we do and by what we are out in other, you know, things that we can talk about to people. When that is taken away, how that changes. 
But I love the idea that he presents that it's not just that junk that is around the house that we have collected for years upon years and that maybe only has meaning for us. And maybe it doesn't even have meaning for us, but it's always been there and what are we going to do with it? And so we'll just have the kids come in and take it when we're gone and then they'll throw it away and, you know, and so forth. But I like that he talks about the psychological stuff that we have to renegotiate with ourselves and that we have to let go. And a lot of that is around when the work that has been a primary source of identity for me changes. And so the question for Parker is this, what do I want to let go of and what do I want to hang on to? I think that's a really important question for any of us aging and noticeably aging and recognizing our aging. What is it that I want to let go of and what do I want to hang on to? It's a question that as we come to kind of a close here, that I, I would really like for you to, Francois, did you want to say something? I just wanted to say like with me, um, Going through my mother's death, and um, it was really transformative because I realized that I had to clean out the closets in my mind, in my spirit, and because my mom was such a big, big on forgiveness, because you have to forgive. And cleaning out all that stuff that's been piled on since I was a child, like all the things that we go through, and cleaning yourself up was the most important thing for me. And with her death, that really took place. And it was hard, and it's painful, and it's, it's a lot of emotions going through. You're gonna find your days, you're crying, because you're reliving this things that happened to you. But that's the best thing that I think you can do. So you can become this whole person and really live the life of Christ and really be effective. Because also with my advocacy work, the love that I have for my community, and I need to be free of all that stuff so I can be positive and make change. And I just wanted to share. Thank you so much. I mean, I love that illustration of cleaning out our closet, literally, spiritually, figuratively. How many of you have had to do that? How many of you have had to clean out the house or a house? It's one of the hardest things. We're going through that with my mother right now, a house that she lived in for almost 50 years. And my mother loves every single thing that she has ever received. And it is, it is everywhere. And we think we sneak in there and take things thinking she won't miss them. And she knows exactly what's missing. I was like, where is that safety pin that was in that that I got at the filling station in 1957 as part of a set that is now all gone except for this one cup. It is absolutely phenomenal. But in the process, what I'm seeing with her is as we let things go, she's freer too. She is starting to find such freedom in not hanging on to so much stuff. And, and part of that is her relationships with others that are stronger and deeper because she's not surrounded by so much other kind of gun and junk that it is holding her back. And I'm kind of inspired by that enough and what you have just said as well, to think it may be time to clean. It may be time to check those closets and to get released. Um, one thing I found about this is this conversation we're having with all of us, you need to have it with your children. I have four children, as, and, and I talk to my children all the time about, uh, just like I was telling Nick today, I told Nick, I said, you're young, you're happy to be on your own. Make friends, don't have a last time. 
so that because when you get older, you find your friends and you don't think it with you, and everybody's gone, and you have to be able to. It, it's very hard to live alone and not be lonely. You know, a lot of people say, "Oh, but I'm not on issue." Because we we've all been raised in a way that the world is saying you need people, and until you free yourself of those restraints, it's all we know. But I don't just talk among my peers. I teach my children. Now when I go home, I'm going to call them and talk about it again because I learned to do things that might happen to me that haven't happened to me yet. My my condition is more for how much growth than uh, age. And I because I don't a lot of times the only thing I worry about is there's nobody there. Because everybody's so busy with their life, and I'm not complaining, but I still say, where's all the energy I put into you as a person that you sucked from me? I gave to you. So uh, I have all my children thinking long term. I teach them to think long term. What do you see yourself? So, okay, who's going to be your friend? Who's going to be there? Uh, there's nobody but you in that house. You know? And those are. Thank you for that. Yeah. And I think just through this year, we're going to talk about some of this. Like, how do we prepare our own selves for aging? How do we prepare our family and, and friends around us as, as we all begin to, to change and so forth? And we are going to talk about um, how to make some plans. For, for ourselves. And I'm really excited about this, this series because I think it's going to give us some tools by which to, to go through life. And again, whether you are a millennial or in the upper echelon of the, I don't know, what was the silent generation or whatever, they, those different generations, that, that we, we are growing up together and that we need to find the tools. So I guess what I want to send you off with today is that you think about what is it that you want to let go of and what do you want to hang on to? And Paul Palmer talks about hanging on to things like your integrity, your values, um, your relationships that are really important. How do you negotiate that? Um, how do you... Um, negotiate how you are going to deal with the loss of your health and your physical ability and, and some of your emotional and, and mental capacity as well. So um, again, think and reflect on what it is that you can let go of and clean out some of that closet. But what is important in that closet that still makes you smile or that you know is still necessary in your life? Um, I close with one final quote. The afternoon knows what the morning never suspected. It does, doesn't it? That's deep. I But the morning never suspected. Yeah. Oh. Palmer goes on to talk about two aspects of reaching out and reaching in. And I don't have time to go into that anymore today, but to say if you read these part of the chapters, he talks about the importance in our aging of reaching out, reaching out beyond ourselves. Things that you all are talking about, community, being in relationship with others, using your life, making your life count for something still, find the integrity, the quality of your life. Do something, just do something um, if you are able to do so. But he also talks about reaching in being comfortable in our own skin, being comfortable with where we are in life, and recognizing, yeah, 
things have changed. But the afternoon is what the morning never suspected. But we're there, and so we live with it. Friends, I think it's so lovely that together in this community of faith, we can talk about these things. And I love that you all have shared today some of your own stories and what it means to age. And I love that I'm growing older now with you. So thank you. See you next week.